Hey everybody, welcome to uh, Neonix Stop the Devastation or the Toxic Truth, as we call it. So, you know, today you'll join our speakers, Dan and Lena, who will uh, explain the science behind the neonicotinoid pesticides and how uh, these are leading to mass losses of our pollinators uh, as well as other wildlife. So, this pending legislation, what makes this urgent and important is that there's pending legislation right now and we need everybody's help in terms of reaching out to our legislators, reaching out to our friends and allies and making sure that your voices and other people's voices are heard on this very important topic. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having us here today. Uh, you know, as mentioned, I am Dan Rochelle. Uh, I'm acting director of NRDC's Pollinator Initiative, and I'm joined here uh, too by Lena Fausto, who um, is working with our action fund and organizing around the Birds and Bees Protection Act, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, you know, the title of the presentation here is Neonics the Toxic Truth, the Pesticides Threatening Bees, Birds, and New Yorkers' Health. And um, we we want to we want to talk about neonics. Um, these really are pesticides that are the most ecologically destructive we've seen since the days of DDT. Um, with many folks sort of likening the destruction we see with neonics to a second Silent Spring, and I think um, you know maybe that'll become a little clearer when we go through the presentation. But um, just to start off where we started off, um, let's talk a little bit about bees. Uh, so as I'm sure this group knows, bees and other pollinators are incredibly important. Uh, one out of every three bites of food that we take comes from bees and other pollinators, uh, the pollination they provide rather. And to give you a sense of what that looks like, here is your typical grocery store in today's world, a world with pollinators. And here's what that grocery store would look like um, if we were to lose our pollinators. So certainly we would, we would still have food. We would just have a lot less of it. We would lose a lot of our most delicious and nutritious choices. And all of it would be much more expensive. Even the produce that um, we would still have, um, a lot of that is helped by pollination. So we would have a lot less food. It would, and, it would, and that, would, of course, would affect uh, food price and food choices. Beyond the grocery store aisle, we also know that bees and other pollinators are critical to ecosystems. So about 80% of the plants on the face of the earth require bees and other pollinators to reproduce. So if we see a loss of our pollinators, we worry not only about food security, but also the collapse of whole ecosystems. And that's basically what we are worried about. Um, in the mid 2000s, beekeepers in New York and across the country suddenly saw that their losses of honeybee colonies uh, spiked. So before that time, they were losing maybe 10, 15% a year, mostly in the winter due to the winter cold. And after that point, they were losing 30, 40, 50% a year. Uh, and again, that change happened virtually overnight. And as you can see in the early, uh, late, uh, aughts, I guess, um, there was not even a recording for summer losses because it wasn't thought that beekeepers would lose bees in the summer. But as you can see in recent years, those summer losses have often been higher uh, or sometimes been higher than, than the winter losses. So something, something changed and this new normal has persisted to this day uh, with beekeepers in New York losing about 45% of their hives last year. Uh, which again would be unthinkable 20 years ago, but is now sort of, you know, the going uh, the going rate. So we know that you know honeybees are, are livestock. Probably this crowd knows that they're not native to the United States, um, and we have good numbers on honeybees be because they are livestock. And additionally, because you know they're they're livestock, they're bred and replaced whenever we lose honeybees. So honeybee colonies have actually remained stable because of a furious breeding effort among beekeepers. But we can't say the same is true for our native bees, uh, or at least not most of them. So um, this is from the Empire, this is a finding from the Empire State Pollinator Survey. It came out uh, just this past summer, 
finding that between 40 and 60% of New York's pollinators are at risk of extirpation or local extinction. So the honeybees here really are the canary in the coal mine for, for something broader that's happening in the ecosystem. Uh, and of course, you know, just as a reminder, that is important not just for ecosystems, but also for crop production. We know that top crops like apples, blueberries, and cherries are pollinator limited nationwide, meaning farmers are already seeing losses of crops because of a lack of pollinators. And as this quote from Dr. Rachel Winfrey, uh, an author of this study shows that it's also pretty risky to put all of our money on honeybees um, because uh, they're increasingly weak and sort of one um, disease or pest away from, from potentially collapsing. So um, there are a lot of problems affecting bees. There's climate change, there's habitat loss, there's parasites, pathogens. Why do we care so much about pesticides and in particular, just one class of pesticides? Um, I think it's first helpful to know what neonics are. So neonicotinoids um, or neonics for short, are neurotoxic insecticides, which means they are pesticides designed to attack insects by um, uh, attacking their nerves. So um, if you've seen a bee that has been acutely poisoned with neonics, what the neonics do is they attach to those nerve receptors in the bee and they overstimulate the nerve receptors until that nerve dies. So, so bees acutely poisoned with neonics will often start to shake uncontrollably and then become paralyzed and die. But neonics are not the only uh, pesticide that kills bees and other insects in gruesome ways. Again, why do we care so much specifically about this class? And there's three big reasons. The first is that neonics are super duper toxic to insects. They're among the most insect toxic pesticides mankind has ever created. And to give you a sense of scale here, just one neonic treated corn seed has enough active ingredient to kill a quarter million bees or more. And in fact, uh, neonics have made US agriculture about 48 times more harmful to insect life uh, than since their introduction. And here's the key, the key chart. Where we see that harmfulness spike, and that's the light blue bar here, the dark blue is all the harmfulness of all other insecticides combined. That harmfulness really begins to spike in the mid 2000s, almost exactly at the same time, we see a spike in losses of honeybee colonies. And while all of these other factors are a problem, again, climate change is a problem, uh, habitat loss is a problem, parasites, pathogens, invasive species, all of those are problems, but they've all been around for a while. There is no other factor that maps so well with that spike in losses of honeybees other than the spike in use of neonic pesticides. The second problem with neonics is that they are really good at contaminating entire ecosystems. So they're designed to permeate plants, to get into the leaves, the roots, the pollen, the nectar, everything, and effectively to make the plant itself poisonous to insects, to make the plant itself the pesticide. And that means they can be applied in all sorts of interesting ways. Of, of course, they can be sprayed like older conventional insecticides, and they are, but more commonly they're applied to soil or literally painted on crop seeds. And here's a picture of some neonics treated corn seed in a, in a planting device. And here is a, is a close up of some neonic treated corn seed. They, they don't always pick the same color. And the idea is, as that corn plant is growing from a seed, it literally soaks up the pesticide coating um, through its roots and becomes toxic itself. The problem being only two to 5% makes it into the target crop. The other 95 plus percent stays in the environment where it persists for years. And anytime uh, it rains, anytime there's irrigation, those properties that let the neonics get up into the crop, namely that they're really water soluble, means that they're also really migratory. So that rain will move them into new soil. If there are plants in that soil, those plants will soak up the pesticide, they'll become toxic. If there's a water supply nearby, that water supply will become polluted. Third problem with neonics is that they are just all over the place. 
So up to 100% of conventional corn is pre-cheated with a, a neonic. That's about a million acres in New York. And um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 75% of soybean acres are also uh, pre-treated with neonics on the seed before planting. Uh, so that's another several hundred thousand acres. It, but even outside of the farm, uh, neonics are all over lawns, gardens, golf courses, you name it. And actually it's those uses that are sometimes the most problematic because uh, neonics are approved for much higher rates than are used in agriculture per acre. So you get these toxic hotspots of, of use around these lawn and garden uses. And um, of course, folks often don't read the labels, right? And they over apply uh, the pesticide only contributing to the problem. So we've seen neonic use, at least in agriculture, go up and up and up. Um, and I'll bring folks attention to this red bar here. That's just the use of imidacloprid. It's one of five EPA approved neonics, but not even the most used in New York in agriculture. And I know 2014 is not the most recent year, but it's the most recent year where we have the seed data, which is really important because that's the largest use. And here's a map of just imidacloprid use in agriculture as it's progressed over the years. And what you can see is that neonic use is all over the place. And I know Long Island here is white uh, and there's, there's some corn here. So you see some filled in uh, over there uh, or some crop use over here. But um, if we were tracking those non-agricultural uses, I guarantee you the entire island would be filled in. Uh, and remember too, this is just one of five EPA approved neonics, not even the most used in New York, and yet you can see it's all over the place. But what this does give you a sense of is these pesticides are being used in the same areas year after year after year. They're persisting in the soil for multiple years, right? And what you have is a situation where because of that year after year use, you have a buildup of toxicity in the soil that is constantly expanding every time it rains or there's lawn watering irrigation, leading to almost ubiquitous contamination of huge areas of New York State uh, with a highly toxic insecticide. So we see that contamination. We definitely see it in water. Uh, neonics frequently appear in New York surface waters. They are the most common insecticide detected in the Long Island aquifer. Uh, not the most common pesticide, the most common insecticide. Um, and all of the levels that are detected or nearly all of them are above EPA benchmark levels for harm. And I'll describe that in a, in a, in a little bit um, with the, and the indication there is that they're likely causing ecosystem-wide damage, especially in aquatic ecosystems. One thing to remember, most of the testing in New York, again, is just for imidacloprid, just one of five and not even the most used in agriculture. And um, so all of the tests that we see, as, as bad as the results look, they're likely an underestimate. And it's also worth noting that conventional chlorination treatment does not remove Neonics from water supplies, only advanced filtration does, but most water systems do not use that filtration. So um, that's sort of the nature of, of the contamination issue. What impact is it having on our environment? Well, as it turns out, neonics are definitely killing bees. And there was actually a, a study that came out, uh, I think just a couple of weeks ago, you know, indicating neonics were sort of the lead cause of deaths of the Western bumblebee or the lead, the lead pesticide cause. And there's just been a huge outpouring of science on this. There, there are countless studies linking neonics to arms to pollinators. But as it turns out, bees are not the only ones affected. And that may not come as a surprise. Um, if, if you imagine that uh, these are insect toxic pesticides and they're throughout the environment, you, you imagine they might be affecting insects everywhere. And that's essentially what's happening. These pesticides are, are hollowing out our ecosystems from the bottom up. That includes our 400 plus species of wild bees in New York, but it also includes all sorts of other insects. And where I, where, where this sort of hits home for people is if you recall in the 1990s, let's say, driving through a rural area in the middle of August, 
you would have to turn your windshield wipers on whether or not it was raining just to get all the bugs off your windshield, right? And think about when is the last time you had to do that? So, so these changes in our environment are actually happening in front of our eyes and we're, we're not noticing them uh, until somebody points it out. But the natural world is noticing and, and it doesn't affect just insects. Um, as it turns out, um, a lot of other animals eat insects and other invertebrates. So when you have fewer bugs, you have fewer, for example, birds. And there's been good research linking the use of neonics to the loss of birds and bird biodiversity, both in the United States and in Europe. And here's a chart that really brings it home. I don't know if folks remember the Cornell report that came out a couple of years ago, finding 50%, um, sorry, 30% bird loss in the last 50 years. Well, two other scientists came in after that and they looked at the research data and they said, well, let's separate out the birds that eat insects from the ones that don't. And if you do that, what you see is that the birds that don't eat insects are actually doing kind of okay. But the birds that eat insects or, or rely on it for their survival, those are the bird species that are really getting hammered. And it's not a surprise. We just have a lot fewer insects than we used to have. Same thing happens to fish. So this is a good study uh, coming out of Japan. Um, they were studying zooplankton. And for those unfamiliar with zooplankton, uh, this is a picture of, of some zooplankton. Although I suppose this crowd might, might be familiar with it. Um, and this, the study authors were, were uh, taking a survey of, of zooplankton in this otherwise sustainable fishery in Japan. And this is a really unique study because we have this long sample size that predates neonics. We just don't have data streams um, like this uh, in our world now that is so permeated with neonics. But what they found is in the early 90s, the zooplankton populations basically hit a wall. And at the same time, unsurprisingly, catches of fish in that fishery that ate the zooplankton also hit a wall because presumably those species starved. Uh, and the study authors later connected it to the introduction of near, neonics in nearby agriculture. And um, I should note, we see similar levels of neonics all over New York waters. And they're, they're not big levels, right? We're talking parts per trillion, but they're still, they're, they're that toxic to invertebrate life that they're still having a, a pretty substantial impact. So um, it's worth noting that, you know, beyond these indirect impacts, there are also direct impacts. So neonics um, uh, can harm vertebrate animals, animals with spines uh, like birds. Just one neonic treated seed has enough active ingredient to kill a small songbird. But even at levels that don't kill birds outright, they can interfere with their, interfere with their neurological systems their ability to migrate, to find food, um, their immune systems, their reproductive abilities. So even if that ingestion of the seed doesn't kill the bird right away, ultimately it can have the effect of killing the bird by, in, by impairing its survival skills or the death of the population by impairing the ability to reproduce. Beyond birds, um, and this is where things get scary, we've also seen a lot of studies linking neonic exposures to harms in mammals. Uh, this is um, from a study of white-tailed deer. So in the upper Midwest, hunters were noticing that uh, the deer they caught had strange things going on with their jaws and their organs. And there was a suspicion that it might be the use of neonic pesticides. So they did a controlled study. And lo and behold, they found that at real world levels, of neonics in water, or the deer were fed neonic contaminated water. Um, deer showed a number of symptoms for the deer that were exposed in the womb. They had a birth defects, so deformed jaws, weird things going on with their organs. And for the adult deer, uh, you saw uh, hypothyroidism, so effect on their sort of endocrine system. And uh, again, for, for prenatally exposed deers, deer exposed in the womb, there was increased rates of mortality as well. So the refrain from industry was that of course, deer are not being exposed to these levels of neonics in the wild. 
Um, but as it turns out, they are. Uh, so this is um, a study from Minnesota uh, that followed the Burheim study. And um, that data from Minnesota found in 2019 that 61% of deer caught from all over the state, this is over 800 deer, had neonics in their bodies with a, a, a little under a third at levels associated with birth defects and death in the study. They redid that study two years later and the numbers jumped. So now neonics are in 94% of deer and these are deer from all over the state, urban and suburban areas, rural areas, agricultural areas, areas near the boundary waters where there's no neonic use for miles and miles. Uh, and 64% of those deer had um, levels associated with birth defects and death uh, in the Burheim study. So um, really scary stuff, but it gets scarier still. So um, uh, several years ago, CDC published some monitoring data, finding that about half the American population has neonics in their body on any given day. But a more recent study, uh, looking at data from 2017 to 2020 of 171 pregnant women from New York and four other states found over 95% had neonics in their bodies with the highest rates in Hispanic women. And here's the key, similar to the, the Minnesota study, those neonic levels were rising both in frequency and concentration over the four-year study. Um, so by all accounts, neonic exposures are getting worse in, in people and in the environment. And um, why that is really important is that we know that um, while the, you know, the, the human health research is not as well along as say on lead or, or other neurotoxins, we see very similar things. Um, exposure to neonics in the womb is linked with higher rates of birth defects of the heart and brain autism-like symptoms, and then in adults, uh, you see reproductive effects on sperm quantity and quality and testosterone as well. Um, so this is just from an op-ed published by Dr. Phil Landrigan, who's a, a, a famous um, children's environmental health expert, used to be at Mount, Mount Sinai, um, likening the concerns with neonics to the concerns that we have with other neurotoxins like lead or mercury. And this is where the, you know, I, I think neonic exposures pose risks for us all, but truly the risks are for small children, for children in the womb. Um, these are points in, in life where the development of the brain is incredibly, incredibly sensitive. And these pesticides, even though they're designed to attack insect nerves, we have the same receptor sites in sensitive areas of our brain and central nervous system. So, so they're especially problematic, even at very low levels. And similar to lead, similar to mercury, you've heard the expression, no safe level. Um, that's what, that's what we um, fear might be the case uh, with neonics. And again, the more, the more research we see, the more it looks like that's the case. Um, I should note really quickly that there are also inequitable impacts when it comes to neonics. Um, the, um, certainly we see higher rates of neonic exposure in Hispanic women uh, from the most recent study, the Buckley study, but there's also differences in how people can, expose, uh, can avoid neonic exposures. If you're eating organic produce, um, you're at lower risk of eating neonics in your food. As you might imagine in conventional produce, you know, the neonics sort of permeate the plant, right? So you can't, you can't wash them off. They're literally inside, inside the fruit or vegetable. Um, but if you eat organic, you can reduce that risk. Uh, if, if there are neonics in your water supply, and we know that neonics do get into water supplies and into people's taps, um, you can remove neonics with advanced filtration, but that's expensive right? And not everybody has the ability to do that. Uh, and of course, water contamination is particularly a concern on, on Long Island. Uh, and I know neonics are not the only one, but especially a concern for uh, folks pulling from groundwater uh, without some sort of uh, filtration treatment. And, um, you know, we already know there was actually an, a recent Harvard paper that came out last month showing that global food production is of fruits and vegetables is down three to five percent. 
already. And we know that's already affecting the price of food crops. So um, again, those impacts on food scarcity of the healthiest and most nutritious foods affect low-income populations uh, the hardest. So um, really quick, you know, that's, that's sort of the scope of the problem. What have folks done about it? Um, while the EU has banned most neonic use, um, they partially banned it in 2013, and they did a complete ban of outdoor use in 2018 of the three most popular neonic chemicals. Uh, Canada has imposed significant restrictions with basically no neonic treated seed use um, being done anymore in Ontario and Quebec. And um, But unfortunately, here in the USA, um, EPA has not done much at all. And this is a longstanding problem with EPA and pesticides. We don't have to get into that right now. Um, but the last sort of proposal from EPA came out during the Trump administration, which essentially blessed uh, business as usual when it came to um, the use of the widespread use of of neonics. EPA is going to be redoing those proposals uh, this spring, but given the long history of the agency sort of falling down on the job, we're, we're not expecting very much out of those new proposals. So that's largely left it to the states. Um, New Jersey and Maine recently banned non-agricultural uh, neonic use over, over there. And in states without a lot of corn and soybean seeds, that's most of the neonic use. So we estimate that New Jersey bans somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80% of the neonics going into its environment every year, which is a pretty big step. And other states have made neonics restricted use, meaning only certified applicators can, can use them. You have to have a license and you have to be trained. But unfortunately, the problem with neonics is not that people are misusing them, it's that the labels are allowing destruction of the environment and contamination of water and risk to human health. So, um, you know, those moves, which include actually now New York, I should put New York on that list, um, they don't prevent landscapers from using the pesticides and they don't prevent the treated seeds, which are by far the largest and most widespread use. So while a, a, a good first step, it certainly can't be the last. And that's where the Birds and Bees Protection Act comes in. Uh, and the bill numbers here for folks who may be calling their electeds are A, 3226 and S1856. Uh, these were, this is a bill that was just recently reintroduced. The Senate sponsor is Hoyleman Siegel, um, and the, the assembly sponsor is Assemblymember Glick. Um, and this bill is based on a Cornell University report that looked at over 1,100 peer-reviewed studies on neonics. Basically, everything had been that had been written on the pesticides to date, and importantly, doing a cost-benefit analysis: neonics versus their likely alternatives. Because the the key question when we have a pesticide is is not whether not only is it bad, is it is it problematic, but if we get rid of it, what's going to replace it, and how does that compare? So. Um, the study found two key things. The first is that the neonic treated corn, soybean, and wheat seeds pose big risk to pollinators, and we also know to, to water ecosystems, et cetera, people's health. Um, but they provided no net income benefit to farmers. So very rarely did they provide a yield benefit. But even when they did, if you looked at the extra cost of having the pesticide on the seed versus the benefit, economically, that's a wash. Um, and the second finding was that turf and ornamental uses, so the lawn and garden uses, um, were also really problematic uh, for bees and other pollinators, some of the most problematic in the study, but likewise were most often not needed, right? Treating a pest problem that simply didn't exist or um, were easily replaced with safer and, and actually more effective alternatives. So um, the act bans just those two categories of uses, sort of the high cost, low benefit uses, I say dumb uses, um, the uses that nobody would miss if we were to get rid of them. And as it turns out, that's 80 to 90% of the neonic use in New York state uh, on, on landscapes. So um, very importantly, other than the 
corn, soybean, and wheat seeds. It doesn't affect any other agricultural uses. So it's very narrow and surgical in that respect. It allows continued invasive species treatment, which we know is important for battling species like hemlock woolly adelgid. And it also allows certain safety valves to suspend the ban if um, non-neonic treated seed is not commercially available. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, really quickly, and I'll wrap up here because I know I've, I've talked a whole lot. Um, the What happened to the bill last year? It did pass the assembly 103 to 41. It didn't get a vote in the Senate, although it had passed there the year earlier. But um, you know, legislation is not horseshoes. We need to pass it in both houses in the same year. Uh, fortunately, it was recently reintroduced and um, it has to go through the committee process again. It has to get floor votes in both houses uh, and it has to be signed by the governor in order to become law. And we very much hope it does all three of those things. So um, here's where I'll turn it over to Lena and probably the most important point of the presentation um, how you can get involved if you would like to. Well, thanks, Dan. Um, so Rewild Long Island already did the, one of the main things to get involved is to sign on to our coalition letter. So thank you. And um, another way to help out with that is to share that letter with other groups or organizations, farmers, um, breweries, um, all kinds of businesses that we're trying to get on the letter. We have a separate letter for breweries as well. Um, and I can reshare all those things uh, to folks send around. Um, another thing is we have our second lobby day, our first in-person lobby day on February 27th. We had our first virtual lobby day on uh, January 24th and it went pretty well. So we're looking forward to the next one. So getting folks up to Albany, um, you know, it's a bit of a bit of a journey from Long Island. So, but um, if you'd like to make the trip, we'd love to have you. Um, and we'll have more lobby days in the future as well. So you can plan for those. Um, and then big one, contacting your legislators. Um, we have a script for calling, which is the, the best um, way to get somebody's attention. Um, we also have a script for sending a letter um, or email, and we can share all of that information as well. Um, and also, you know, reaching out to the other leaders of the houses and the governor's office as well um, to let them know that you're supportive of this bill. Um, another way is to write an op-ed or a letter to the editor, and we have templates for that that we'd be happy to share. Um, it's a great way to get some attention in your in your community on the issue. Um, and then just sharing the message, um, getting info on Facebook, on Instagram, social media, um, just getting people more involved. So if you're interested in any of those things, and I can I can share them um, via email, all of those resources as well. So thank you. And with that, I think we'll turn it over to questions. Yeah, anybody with questions, you can either post in chat or ask away. Um, you can put your hand up and ask away if there are more than one. But, um. I have a question. If you have used the seeds that you're talking about that have been treated, and then you plant in the soil that you had with maybe some amendments, but you plant in that soil, are you then still perpetuating it? The neonates in the soil? Um, so, I mean, you're not adding additional neonics, but can the neonics that were in the soil from before get into the new plants that yes. you have planted? Yes. Oh. Yeah. But I mean, look, the, the good news with neonics is that unlike forever chemicals, um, although there was a, a study recently that, that found um, PFAS in, in a number of in neonic products, um, but the neonics themselves do break down. So, um, you know, after a period of time, they should uh, break down in the soil. Now, I talked with a soil scientist that said, well, maybe all the breakdown products of neonics, because right, they break down into other things. Um, we're not sure that all of the breakdown products fully break down, and some of those are toxic too. But at least the thought is currently that neonics are not forever chemicals. They do break down eventually, al although it takes time. Mm, thank you.
Um, are there any virtual lobby days coming or uh, are the lobby days in uh, Albany? Away? So, yeah, I, I, I hate to ever, we hate to advertise uh, lobby days in Albany to, to, a, to a Long Island crowd because I know it's quite, quite a hike up there. Um, so don't, don't feel tremendous pressure, but, um, we did have a virtual lobby day in, uh, late January. Sorry, we didn't advertise that better. And I think we may have opportunities in, in the future to do virtual stuff. Uh, you know, especially with folks in different parts of the state, we realize that that's the best way to be involved. So if we do have other opportunities, and I think we might, um, we'll be sure to let you guys know. Uh, somebody has their hand up. Um, yes, Raju, I do. Uh, this is Leonard. Um, just a quick question about labeling. I assume, uh, or maybe I, this is a bad assumption, but is there any requirement uh, for uh, products that, are, uh, for example, nursery plants that have, uh, whether you know, well, to let the consumer know whether they are treated with neonics or not? Uh, I assume not, but. Uh, is there any, if, if there is, that would be great, but if not, is there any effort to provide some kind of labeling so consumers can be aware of what they're buying? Um, so for pesticide products, there's definitely labeling. So the, you know, the, the treatment products themselves, although you would have to know what the neonic chemicals are. You would look yes. at the label. It, it doesn't say neonics. There are five chemicals, and so you'd have to you'd have to know what the names of the chemicals are. So it's a little bit tricky there. Um, with seeds, uh, neonic treated seeds will be colorized, mm -hmm. uh, and I have been told that grass seed does not contain neonics. Grass seed is often colorized, but that is that is not neonics. I, again, I haven't verified that, but I've been told that by a landscaper. Um, Usually, you know, neonic treated seeds are going to be crop seeds. So I think for most folks that are buying seeds, uh, there's there's small risk that they would be treated with neonics. And again, they would be colorized. Um, for the nursery plants themselves, I am unaware of any requirement that, you, you know, tells folks what the plants have been treated with. I know some nurseries uh, especially native nurseries, and I know this crowd is probably going for more native plants. Often native nurseries will not use neonics and they'll indicate that they don't use neonics. Certainly organic nurseries do not use neonics. Any organic products uh, cannot use these pesticides because they are synthetic. Um, I know there have been efforts for, uh, at labeling bills in the past. I don't know if there's been one in New York, but I know in other states. Um, but so far, to my knowledge, I, I don't know of any state that requires uh, that label. But you can ask your nursery, mm -hmm. and hopefully they'll be honest. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Kimberly asked if, there are, if there's a list of residential brands uh, that include uh, neonics that are available to homeowners. Is there anything on the website or on your website, or, or is it something that product by product we have to go and look at the ingredients? Um, so there are certain products that are, are definitely have neonics. Um, I'm trying to think in the residential sphere, there's, there's Merit, which is a lawn treatment uh, that has uh, neonics. And then there used to be a line of products, Bayer Advanced, which is now Bio Advanced after Bayer divested of them when they purchased Monsanto. Um, I believe most of those contain neonics as well. One of the issues with neonics is that they're off of patent. So there's all sorts of folks that produce neonic products and they come in all, um, there's multiple different names. I should also note, and I didn't talk about it much in my presentation, but uh, there are also neonic indoor products, right? Bed bug products and um, flea and tick treatment. There's all sorts of veterinary products that use neonics. So um, I think when we looked at it, there were over a thousand products that use imidacloprid as an active ingredient. So there, there's quite a few products and, and quite a few brand names. Again, the best way to know 
if you're using a neonic is to know the names of the chemicals and to, to look at the pesticide label of any product you buy. And one thing I will caution folks, if you ever see a product that's like three in one rose garden, you know, it, it fertilizes and it also kills bugs. Anything that says it does this and it also kills bugs, um, chances are that product has a neonic in it because it typically those are systemic insecticides, right? Those that are stay in the soil and get soaked up into the plant. So uh, just be careful with those products. Uh, Dan, could you quickly flash up that slide which had the list of five so people can take a quick photo? Okay. And just so folks know, the aquaprid is no longer approved for use in the United States. And actually there were there are concerns about health harms for that that product. Um, I think you'll, you're going to see a lot more actually um, about neonics and the health concerns. We, we, we didn't see a lot of publications on it for a while, but recently there's been a lot of, of publication on it. Uh, and again, the, you know, the concern with, um, some of these products is their high water solubility. And there was actually a study that just came out recently finding that neonics pass from the pregnant mother through the placenta to the fetus actually quite efficiently, which again is, is not surprising um, knowing the properties of, of these pesticides. Uh, any other questions? I know we have a couple of comments in chat. Yeah, why why is there not more restriction, res, more, bleh, start over. Why is there not more restriction into what the homeowner can use in their yards? They seem to be like the biggest abuser of all chemicals. So why is it still so easily available for them? Well, I think a lot of pesticides are, are easily available. Uh, and I, that's just the system of pesticide approval that, that we have currently. Um, I, I think there is a lot of criticism that can be rightly placed at US EPA's foot. Yeah. I mean, we use all sorts of pesticides here in the United States that are banned in Europe, a number that are banned yeah. in China, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, exactly. there are dozens of pesticides that are approved for use in the United States that the Chinese government has said are are, are unacceptable. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's it, we have a very permissive um, federal government when it comes to the approval of pesticides. We have very permissive laws. And um, this is the result. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, a pesticide applicator is technically supposed to have a pesticide, you know, applicator license, but the homeowner doesn't need one. <laughs> the, the homeowner doesn't need one. And again, we see big concentrations uh, in uses, particularly near golf courses, too. Absolutely. Um, but, um, you know, the, the treated seeds nationwide has got to be the most you know, ridiculous use of, of these pesticides because again, study after study is showing, and it's not just the Cornell report. We've had several reports after Cornell published its paper, scientific studies showing that they provide no economic benefits to farmers. And yet, you know, we have a hundred million acres, something like that of corn in the United States. And chances are, you know, 90 plus percent of that is treated with neonics and almost none of it providing benefits. So, so the, the system is broken, the market is broken here, right? Because these are input costs that farmers are paying for and they're not getting advantage from. And they're polluting the environment, they're killing pollinators, they're, they're hollowing out ecosystems, they're contaminating water. Um, so yeah, the, the system is broken, uh, certainly. And again, that's why it's so important for states to act because states, as we've seen on this issue and, and so many others over the years, it's states that are taking the lead in sort of restoring sanity. And um, I think that's what New York needs to do. So I'll, I'll just uh, stop the share here. Yeah, and please, yeah, please everybody just call. Uh, if you need to find your local legislator or the most effective way of um, that you could contribute, please reach out to uh, Lena. And, and just to emphasize how much a call really matters. I think emailing your, your local electeds is, is great. Um, but that call, they really, that really resonates. If somebody takes the time to make a call, they know that people care and, and they count that, right? I mean, they have staff and, and they take note uh, when somebody calls on this issue. 
So there's um, there's certainly if you don't know your um, rep state representatives, there are um, websites online where you know look up my assembly member and uh, you type in your address and they'll tell you who it is and and what their contact information is. Um, Suffolk County, is there any specific Suffolk County effort alongside the New York State movement or is it all folded into one big coalition right now? I don't know of a particular Suffolk County effort. I know that Suffolk County is one of the few water systems in the U.S. that actually looks at neonics in, in drinking water in the main systems. And I know that imidacloprid um, does show up. I think there's, I think that, you know, for the water treatment systems on Long Island, I assume, and, and I'm not intimately familiar, that some of them are probably better than average just because of the, the history of, of pesticide contamination of the aquifer. But I mean, even with that treatment, we do see imidacloprid occasionally show up in some of the larger uh, water districts in, in Suffolk. So um, again, I, I think probably the, the treatment is, is pretty good for the public systems in, in Long Island, but um, we still do see neonics coming through, which just shows how, how, how tricky they are to get out of water. And again, there's, there's 200,000 people on Long Island that pull from well water. And, um, you know, maybe some of them have like a reverse osmosis system, but I'm, I'm guessing most don't. Yep. Okay, um, so, so, so thanks a lot. I mean, I think uh, vote 411 as, as someone posted here, uh, that was uh, Julia, um, is a great website for you to find your elected official. That's the League of uh, Women Voters. Um, so there's so many different ways you can help. So please do reach beyond that concern and turn that concern into action, because this is the right time. We need to get it done in this legislative session, if we can. Um, it's it's really critical. Um, so so with that, I would thank our speakers, and as always, you can go to our website www.rewildlongisland.org, subscribe to our announcement list, and you'll see the recording. Uh, posted um, soon enough on there. Thanks again, everybody. Have yourself a wonderful night and thanks for joining us here.